Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spurs Up Show, best Gamecocks podcast on the internet. Today is Monday, September the 6th, 2021. Today's show, what a debut for Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks in this 2021 football season as South Carolina throttles the Eastern Illinois Panthers by a final score of 46 to nothing. Guys, I'll break down what was a hell of a night at williams Bryce Stadium on Saturday. Also, guys, I'll talk my biggest takeaway from the Gamecocks win. We're going to hand out some game balls in our weekly TSUS game ball segment. We'll also talk Slap Dick of the Weekend, the Cock of the Walk Award, and much, much more as South Carolina begins a new season in style. Also, guys, we do have news and notes to get into, your listener questions and voicemails, and also a fantastic conversation, a great interview with the man who was on the call for the game Saturday night as Chris Doring of SEC Network joins me to talk Shane Beamer, South Carolina, his takeaways and impressions from the Gamecocks, big 46 nothing win. Guys, we got all that, much more on a packed show here on Monday, and it's all brought to you by our friends over at Upstate Movers Group. Guys, Upstate Movers Group, superior moving service, they bring care and attention other companies can't offer because they're just too busy maintaining trucks and profiting off of them instead of focusing on service. Guys, service is what separates Upstate Movers Group from the competition. They're not a trucking company. They're a moving services company, and they're also employee-owned co-op. Their movers are paid twice the industry average, and everyone on the crew is invested in your success. They have dedicated professional crew members, and they also offer black glove service. They offer end-to-end packing services, custom crating and packaging special items, and cleaning services at as well. They're founded by Greenville natives and University of South Carolina alumni guys. So a Gamecock owned small business. They also offer 20 years of project management moving experience, and they can offer logistics and solutions that traditional moving companies simply do not have the skills for. Guys, whether in the upstate or across the state of South Carolina, if you have any moving needs in 2021, be sure to check out our friends over at Upstate Movers Group. You can find them on social media at Upstate Movers Group. Of course, if you have any other questions, go to their website, upstatemoversgroup.com. That's up upstatemoversgroup.com. Be sure to check them out and tell them Chris from the Spurs Up Show sent you. Let's get it. That 1-0 feeling as the Gamecocks begin their 2021 football season in style. Ladies and gents, boys and girls, happy Monday. Hope you're all doing well. Appreciate you guys tuning in. We have got a packed show here on a Monday, the first game recap show as we break down what happened on Saturday night as the Gamecocks take EIU back behind the woodshed and lay it to the Panthers by a final score of 46 to nothing. Folks, again, appreciate you all tuning in. I am Chris Phillips, show Spurs Up Show. As always, I hope this finds you well, whatever you may be doing, wherever you may be, whether it be on the commute, in the office. Hey, maybe you're taking advantage of the holiday weekend and you have the day off. Again, folks, thank you all so much for taking the time to tune in. First things first, I know this is a holiday weekend today being Labor Day. Happy Labor Day to you all. Hope you're all doing well. Hope you're enjoying the day. Maybe you're relaxing. And again, if you're hearing the sound of my voice on this Labor Day, thank you all so much for including me in your holiday plans uh, to let you guys know, though, we'll be full-fledged, full steam ahead, normal schedule this week, podcast Monday through Friday, the Daily Crow Monday through Friday. So, again, nothing to worry about there in regards to a change of schedule or anything changing with the content this week. But, again, folks, appreciate you all tuning in. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And I want to start there. First thing, guys, to everyone who came out to the live show at Halls on Friday night, to the tailgate on Saturday, the live pregame game day show we had at Jay's Corner. To all of those who came up and said hello and shook my hand and showed their love and support, whether it be at the tailgate, in the stadium, whatever it may be, thank you all so much. I had pretty high hopes and pretty high expectations for what this weekend would be uh, in regards to things not on the field. 
and in regards to things not in directly involving the Gamecocks, of course, with our events and business and stuff like that and meeting you all, and it even exceeded my expectations. Nothing about this weekend disappointed, and again, that was all because of you guys. The tailgate was incredible getting to meet so many great Gamecocks and talk with you all and drink a couple of cold beers and certainly more cold beverages were <laughs> consumed then EIU points scored, which is something beautiful and something you love to see. But again, folks, again, I, I just can't say enough good things. Thank you all so much for making the TSUS and Big Cock Club tailgate a massive, massive success. Sea Wells was absolutely rocking all day Saturday. And then, of course, that bled over into williams Bryce Stadium as we saw the crowd and the energy and the atmosphere that South Carolina Nation, you knew they were going to show up and show out. And we're going to get to that more in just a second. But again, folks, Thank you all so much for the love and support and continuing to show that love and continuing to tune in, continue to rock with the content, rock with everything we do, guys. Without you all, none of what we do would be possible. Those tailgates, those events, just simply talking to you right here on the podcast, none of it would be possible. So again, folks, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And I cannot wait to hang out with and party with each and every single one of you every single day home game out at Sewell spots 93 to 96 and we're going to be out there all season long and of course I'll be promoting that on social media all throughout the year but again folks thank you so much uh, this weekend kicked ass and it was all because of you guys you guys made this weekend a massive 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 success so again thank you all so much guys a couple of quick updates and reminders before we really get going here in this Monday show uh, we are out at 10 Roof again Wednesday, 5 to 7. Stay tuned on who the guest may be. If there's going to be a guest, I have not decided quite yet. I was kind of thinking what may be fun on Wednesday is just to literally have an open floor, open mic Q&A session and just talk about the EIU game and, of course, preview the game this upcoming weekend against the East Carolina Pirates. Could be a really fun thing, but just stay tuned for that. But of course, we're back out at 10 Roof Wednesday, 5 to 7. And I do want to remind you about our watch party in downtown Greenville, South Carolina at Carolina Ale House this Saturday. For those who cannot make the trek up to Dowdy Ficklin Stadium and for those upstate Gamecocks that – you know, maybe you guys, I really, by the way, respect the Gamecocks that live in Anderson, Greenville, just any part of the upstate. I've got a couple of buddies up there, and I know it's brutal. I know it's rough on you all dealing with those folks in orange and purple, and it's a little bit easier this week, obviously, because guess what? We're 1-0, and and they're 0-1, and our GA quarterback had four touchdowns, and their quarterback had zero. So, sucks to suck, Gabba. But either way. Um, locked in on our event again this weekend. Very excited. Carolina Alehouse will be throwing a watch party for the noon game, the game against East Carolina in downtown Greenville this Saturday, September the 11th. Guys, doors open at 11, kickoffs at noon. Yours truly will be there at 11. Very, very excited to see some upstate Gamecocks. And I think I told you guys this before, but I'll tell you again. This was something I was really, really passionate about when uh, Carolina Alehouse approached me in regards to potentially partnering for the season and doing watch parties in different locations and stuff like that. And I was like, you know, you guys have a downtown Greenville location. I really want to get up to the upstate and give back to those upstate Gamecocks. Because, again, I know you guys – don't get nearly the love and appreciation you guys deserve. There aren't many Gamecocks offerings in the upstate. I think also, guys, we're also partnering with the Greenville Gamecock Club, um, doing some cross promotion for this as well. So, again, guys, would love to have you all out. Downtown Greenville location, Carolina Alehouse. Come out and let's cheer on the Gamecocks together as South Carolina looks to move to 2-0 and early in this 2021 football season. With that being said, guys, let's – talk about it let's break it down let's let's relive what an opener for South Carolina and Shane Beamer as the Gamecocks take care of business final score of 46 to nothing 46 to nothing you know when you look at this game again first things first guys the atmosphere the day itself you know I told you guys that this was much much bigger than just a football game right I thought this was much bigger than a football game it really represented and stood for a celebration for a new era of Gamecocks football. The Shane Beamer era, of course, coming to a head Saturday night, putting it on the field, executing, laying it out there, and getting a big win. But it really served as a greater thing, in my opinion. What it symbolized in regards to a celebration of a new era of Gamecocks football, you could feel it from the moment you woke up 
And I was able to get out there and go to the tailgates and go to go to Jay's and go to Seawells and all that good stuff in the morning. And you could feel it, man. You could feel it in the air, the return of that hope and that optimism. And again, hope is not a strategy. But if you don't have hope, you don't have anything. And it felt great to wake up and be like, you know what? I'm excited for game day again. Game day is fun again. So give kudos to Shane Beamer. He's done that very early in his tenure. Now, in the stadium, I was a little harsh on Saturday night in regards to my thoughts on the crowd. I was a little disappointed with the crowd, and I don't, I don't want to start this off on a negative note or anything like that. I do want to say, though, guys, when you think about it and everything going on in the world and just the cost of how much it is to take a family of four, for example, to a football game and all of that that goes into it with the travel and the tickets and the food and the, and the gas and all of that, I understand. I thought there would be a little bit more. I think the announced attendance was like 64,000. I thought it'd be closer to like a 72, 73,000, whatever. Those that were in there, I can tell you this much. They were loud. They were rowdy. I thought the atmosphere was incredible. Sandstorm, Gamecock walk, guys, was wild. When you look at the video, you look at the videos, the atmosphere was incredible. I mean, it, it went 10, 11, 12, 13 people deep from what I saw. So, absolutely great stuff. I thought Gamecock Nation, you guys, pat yourself on the back. Give yourself some kudos. You guys showed up and showed out. And, again, for those that were in the stadium, it was loud. It was rowdy. It was incredible. I thought we did a great job of supporting our team and uh, pushing the boys through and giving them that support they needed to get a big-time W. Now, on the field, right, 46 to nothing. We talked about all week going in this game. This was the perfect opener. And the perfect way for Shane Beamer to make his debut at South Carolina. And I'll be honest, guys, this game went basically exactly like I thought it would. You know, we picked 56 to 10 last week. The Gamecocks won by 46. And I know we've spent a lot of the preseason talking offense and quarterbacks and receivers and running backs. And, of course, those are the quote-unquote most fun things to talk about. I think fans really enjoy Talking offense, of course. It's all about offense in today's day and age of college football. But let's first start with that Carolina defense. How about a round of applause? And let's give kudos to Clayton White and his unit for what they did. Guys, Gamecocks defense by the numbers. Just how dominant was South Carolina on defense? Guys, the Gamecocks only allowed 109 total yards. 109 total yards to the Eastern Illinois Panthers, 2.5 yards per play. In comparison, the Gamecocks had 5.9 yards per play. You were able to force turnovers, right? Able to force turnovers, two interceptions, one that was returned for a touchdown. You were opportunistic. Your defensive line, I think, most certainly lived up to the hype, at least in Saturday night's game. 31 yards rushing for EIU, 1.4 yards per carry. And again, the facts that we know about this football team on both sides, and again, we're starting defensively, but the fact that we knew about this defense coming in this game, it was only reinforced and I think reconfirmed in that game Saturday night. The defensive line is full of creatures, quote unquote, as Jimmy Lindsay likes to call them. You've got some really freakish athletes up front, guys. I mean, J.J. Nigbari, what he did. I thought Jabari Ellis had a really, really good game. You saw Jordan Strawn flash a couple of times. Zach Pickens with a couple of big sacks. I really loved seeing guys like Aaron Sterling and Brad Johnson get involved with a couple of stacks. Jordan Birch, man. Holy smokes. You know, him making that play, I really hope and I really think that could be a play that sparks Jordan Birch. We talked about him all preseason about being a dude for you and, you know, a former five-star prospect and kind of living up to that and taking that next step this year. Again, it's EIU, right? No conclusions drawn. But I tell you what, that play he made, and not just to make the catch, but that run after the catch on that pick six, wow. I mean, that is why that kid was a five-star prospect. That is freakish athleticism that you simply cannot coach. So again, I thought your defensive line did a hell of a job, made life hell all night long for Otto Coons. They were in the backfield getting after the quarterback. The secondary had a solid night, no question. I thought your linebackers, your secondary, your second level, the back end of your defense had a solid night. Jalen Foster 
with the interception. You loved seeing Cam Smith out there and him getting an opportunity and him being healthy, and I thought he played well. I thought Jalen Dickerson did a really, really good job. Uh, he had a tackle for a loss you know, later in that game, and I thought he did a good job in your back half. Okay? I thought they did a good job. Moving to offense, because, again, I've got some overall thoughts as a whole as well. Offensively, commend Zeb Nolan, guys. Really give credit to Zeb Nolan, the job he did. Again, his overall stats, they're nothing crazy. They're nothing that's going to win you a Heisman Trophy or an all-conference you know, type deal. 13 of 21, 121 yards, and four passing touchdowns. Who would have called that? Four passing touchdowns for Zeb Nolan. But again, we talked about you hand the keys over to this guy. And I think the I think the the chatter and the banter behind, oh, why did Zeb Nolan start instead of Jason Brown and Colton Gothier? What were they thinking? I think that conversation is put to rest, at least for this week. Because Zeb Nolan to me, you know, he did exactly what I thought he would do. He looked like a veteran guy. It looked like this wasn't his first rodeo. He looked like the entire game from the opening snap. He was in command of this offense. I thought Zeb did an incredible job knowing where to go with the football. He didn't put the football in harm's way. And I don't like calling these guys a game manager. I thought he was a field general out there. He did show some good zip on some passes. Again, he, he, he fit the ball in some really tight windows. You wonder in a game against better competition, is, is, is he able to do that if he's going to continue to play this year? Which, again, I'm going to get to that more in just a second. But tip your cap. I thought Zeb Nolan had a phenomenal game for you and gave you exactly what you needed. Didn't do anything stupid. Didn't put the ball in harm's way. He got his football team to the line. He was able to run that offense efficiently. And like I told you guys, I think that was the goal from the moment they named Zeb Nolan the starter. Hey, Colton Gothier is a true freshman. Jason Brown has upside. Yes, those guys do have upside. And again, of course, I told you guys, multiple quarterbacks were going to play. We saw all three of those guys, Nolan, Jason Brown, and Colton Gothier. But it, it was easy to see from the very, very beginning of that football game, in my opinion, why Zeb Nolan was chosen as the guy. Again, a very clean game, a very efficient game in regards to running the offense, getting yourself lined up, set up in week one. That is a very, very big deal. And I thought also, again, he played really, really well. In a night two, where moving to the wide receivers, guys. Again, this is a game that only reconfirmed Everything I thought about this football team um, on the outside, Josh Van, I thought of the wide receiver position was a guy that flashed. I thought he truly flashed on Saturday night. And I think he showed, you know, we talked about going all week. Who's going to be the guy out of Van Brooks and Joyner out of that starting lineup? Who is most likely the guy that is going to take that step for you and be that go to guy on the outside? I think Josh Van showed himself as he is that guy. Again, all the upside with him, former four-star prospect out of Tucker, Georgia. I remember watching his film and his tape coming out of high school. The guy was making freakish circus catches, and I think you saw some of that explosiveness and that, that athleticism um, on Saturday night. Again, had a couple of touchdowns, really, really good stuff from him. A very positive sign, I think, for Josh Vanagan, a guy that got sort of buried in the depth chart the last couple of years and sort of waited his turn behind some really, really good receivers that are currently playing in the NFL. I thought Josh Van had a really good night, and that was a great thing to see and a positive for him. There's no question your tight ends are going to be a major, major part of your offense. Nick Muse, Jaheim Bell loved their games. I was a little surprised we didn't see more of EJ Jenkins, or that we didn't really see him make an impact in this football game. But guys, I'm telling you right now, Jaheim Bell has the potential to be this year's Kevin Harris. And, and what I mean by that is a guy that, you know, especially nationally, nobody is expecting anything crazy from him. He's certainly not a household name. I think Jaheim Bell could be that guy because this is a guy, again, these are not your traditional tight ends, hand in the dirt, three yards in a cloud of dust, just big body guy moving people around. And if he can catch a ball every now and then, cool. Dude, Jaheim Bell is a true Swiss army knife on this football team. We saw him catch a touchdown. Hell, we saw him run for a touchdown that got taken back on the little fullback handoff that I thought was a great play call, by the way. Um, we saw him do it in a number of ways, in a number of ways. Saturday night against EIU. I think Jaheim Bell is a guy that's got as much upside as anyone on this football team. I think he's going to be an absolute threat for a Gamecocks offense that is still looking for playmakers as you go into week two and you continue to navigate this 2021 football season. My biggest disappointment, guys, probably in the football game 
was the offensive line. And again, you did enough to get the job done, right? You did. Um, when you take a look at the numbers, you ran for 254 yards, 47 carries for 254 yards as a football team, 5.4 yards per carry. You only ran for one touchdown, but Zeb Nolan did throw four of them. But my disappointment stems from, you know, I, I don't know if maybe I set improper expectations in my own mind. I don't think I did. Because, guys, getting to the point of the overall game, and by the way, before I do that, really quick shout out, how about freaking – Beamer ball. Yes, Beamer ball felt early. We wondered how quickly would we feel the positive impact of Beamer ball and making a big play in special teams and blocking a punt or having a big return. And sure enough, the Gamecocks block two punts on Saturday night, as well as convert on a two point conversion at the very beginning of the football game. I'll tell you this, guys, if nothing else, I don't know if every single game the Gamecocks are going to block a punt or do something crazy in special teams. But you can just tell that is a really, really, really well-coached unit. A really well-coached unit. I mean, just the, the crispness, the execution in week one, you could tell South Carolina knew what EIU was going to do. They knew what they wanted to do, and they executed. So, again, kudos and commend Shane Beamer and Pete Limbo. I told you guys all preseason that if nothing else, that's probably going to be the most well-coached special teams unit in the entire country. And I think they showed you that on Saturday night. But again, stepping back and looking at this game as a whole, because I talked about offensive line and did I set improper expectations? I didn't think they did the greatest job in the run game in regards to pushing guys around. And I, I think most fans and most people I just talked to, I mean, I've talked to a couple of former players today and I see fans tweeting. I think we're all in agreement. The offensive line has got to play better. When you've got four or five guys back on your offensive line, when you have over 80 career starts and you've got the type of talent that we know we have up front, you have got to be better because you had that 254 yards rushing but it felt like a grind to get that 254 yards. By the way, the running backs, Marshawn Lloyd, I think he showed you some real explosiveness. We kind of saw, you know, why he's been touted as that guy. You saw some runs where you said, oh, wow, there it is. There's Marshawn Lloyd. It was great, though, just the fact he is 110% healthy, looked really, really good. You saw the shiftiness, saw the agility. Zaquandre White. What a game for that young man. I mean, just literally picked up right where he left off in regards to the spring game. Looked incredible. Average 10 yards per touch. But again, this football game as a whole, guys, like I said, there's no better way that you could have asked to start the Shane Beamer era. 46 to nothing. You pitch a shutout. The game was never in doubt. There was never, in my opinion, an uncomfortable moment in williams Bryce Stadium where you – you, you know, you doubted the status of the game or you, you, you second question, you know, oh, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? I thought the game plan was very aggressive, by the way. Like I said, I was very surprised actually how much we threw the football. Um, was very surprised how much we threw it. But again, Zeb Nolan giving you a very, very good start in the center, knowing exactly where to go with the football. But I was surprised a little how much we threw it. But other than that, guys, like we said all week, and I am not here to be Debbie Downer. I am not being negative. I'm not being pessimistic, of course. But I do want to enter some perspective and some reality. Because I'll tell you this, and I don't know who the guy is, but I was sitting next to a Gamecock in the stands on Saturday night. Shout out to everybody that was around me, by the way. We had an incredible time, great conversation, really, really good stuff. But I had a Gamecock next to me. And I found myself for <clears throat> a lot of the fourth quarter trying to sort of talk him down from the heightened expectations and allowing himself to get carried away because of what we saw on Saturday night. The Gamecocks did exactly what they should have done in this football game. Guys, watching that game Saturday night, I mean, it was like watching varsity versus B team. EIU doesn't belong anywhere on the field with South Carolina, and we all expected that going in. An absolutely putrid, putrid opponent, and that's taking away nothing from South Carolina, but he was talking to me about, man, I look at this team at eight and four, eight and four, eight and four. And I've been telling you guys, or I've been telling you for weeks, hey, there are definitely talented individual players on this football team. There's no question. But there are still holes in this roster, period, point blank, bottom line. And the competition is going to get much, much, much stiffer than what we saw on Saturday night. My biggest concerns coming out, man, I mean, you got to think. Like I said, the competition. 
you took care of your business, but you leave Saturday night's game. And again, you can't draw conclusions anyways, but we'll start offensively. Man, I mean, you, you leave Saturday night's game still with huge, huge question marks at the wide receiver position. Zaquandre White, literally your leading receiver in the football game. And did South Carolina take their foot off the gas pedal a little bit in the second half? I mean, I think certainly. They scored 17 points. One of the, you know, a touchdown of that was on a pick six. You know, were they, you know, running the offense, particularly at full steam, like in the first half? No. So maybe those numbers you could argue, maybe you could argue they're going to be skewed a little bit. But anybody who watched that game, there's no denying the Gamecocks. The wide receiver position is still a deficiency. Everything we thought about this football team, I think, still stands to this point. Running back room is a plus. Wide receivers are a weakness. You feel like the offensive line will make a big jump and make big strides from week one to week two. They've got to get it together in run game. I thought in pass blocking, they were actually really, really good. Run blocking got to be better. On the defensive side, we know about the creatures up front. We know how good that defensive line is and the type of athleticism and playmakers you feature there. Not to take anything away from the secondary, you just still don't know. You, you, you just What did you really learn in that football game on Saturday night? What did you learn? What did you learn? And I'd say the only thing, like I said, guys, I'm being very nitpicky, right? That's, that's what I do what I do because I can be nitpicky. And I'll be totally honest with you. As I sat there 29 to nothing at halftime, it was a game where South on a very, very fun night for the boys in Garnet Black. And I told you guys it would be. And like I said, the game went, I mean, damn near exactly like I expected. Truly, truly. I picked a 46-point win. What happened? A 46-point win for South Carolina. And again, I'm not, I'm not normally that guy that's tooting my own horn. Look at me. Look at my predictions. But I, because guys, I get plenty of predictions wrong, and I own it to you guys when I do. But the game went as I expected. Here was my thing, though, guys. Even at halftime, leaving the game, I said to myself, great win, great win, great way to open the Beamer era. You couldn't have asked for a better way. But did South Carolina really dominate? Did did it feel like they just dominated from the opening whistle and shoved the EIU around? That's what I left Willie B most feeling like I missed out on. On Saturday night, I was really disappointed with the offensive line. You've got to be able to get a push. You've got to be able to get a push. And of course, the question now turns because I think the O line will come into its own. I think they'll be better. I don't know what it was Saturday night. I mean, I, you know, and it's not like they did like a porous job. I don't want to make it sound like it was just misery. I mean, when you run for 254 yards, you did some good things. You know, you busted a really long one late, was a Quandre White. You know, you had a running back average over 10 yards per carry. You know, they played well enough to do those things. But like I said, the competition's only going to get stiffer. And you did what you should have done. There's no question. There's no question. You did what you should have done. Now, of course, the question moves to the quarterback position. And guys, I'll tell you right now, like I said, I think Zeb Nolan did a phenomenal job. You can see why he was chosen as the starter for week one. You can see why Shane Beamer and Marcus Satterfield entrusted him with the keys to the car, if you will, the keys to the offense, and let him run this thing on Saturday night. But my take, guys, Luke Doty is this team's starting quarterback. He is. And listen, if Shane Beamer comes out this week and says, Zeb Nolan is our starter, he gives us the best chance to win right now, we feel confident in him. I'm going to ride with whatever Shane Beamer says, okay? I am in no place, and I don't, think, I don't think any of us are, right? And this is not to say that Shane Beamer is above criticism or is above questioning, because he's not, right? When you're getting paid millions of dollars to coach, it's okay. It's okay to question. It's okay to rec- critique. But I have no reason not to trust Shane Beamer and his decision-making when it comes to decisions made for this football team. But again, You can't draw conclusions from Saturday night's game. You just can't do it because of the competition you were facing. But I think a lot of things we thought about this football team going into the season were only reconfirmed in my mind. This is going to be a football team that has to run the football to win. Until proven otherwise, until others step up, 
the wide receiver position is a massive, massive deficiency. And like I said, I'm rolling with whoever Shane Beamer says should be our starting quarterback. But it's just hard for me right now to believe that Luke Doty doesn't give you the best chance to win, that the best version of this offense comes with Luke Doty under center. Because, guys, Zeb Nolan, I don't think anybody would mistake and say he is a dynamic player. You know, he didn't make a throw. I mean, I'm not trying to take anything away from him. He didn't make a throw to me where he made the throw and I said, oh, wow, like that, that's, that's a throw nobody else on our roster can make, right? I, I didn't see a throw like that. Again, I thought he did a really, really good job of distributing the football. He got it to his backs. He got it to his tight ends. He didn't put it in harm's way, really. He didn't do anything crazy. But again, that was EIU on Saturday night, even going into this weekend at East Carolina. And of course, the following weekend against Georgia, and you get into SEC play. At some point, to win a football game, you're going to have to be dynamic on offense. And Luke Doty is the guy that gives you the best opportunity, in my opinion, to do so. Again, it's a very interesting storyline, but I did not leave because the question mark was, man, if Zeb Nolan balls out, you know, does he steal the job? Should you keep him out there? Is he going to start in Greenville? I, I just didn't leave williams Bryce Stadium, guys, with the feeling like, God, he, he just took the job tonight, man. He, he's, he's head and shoulders our best option. He's so much better than everybody else. I did not have that feeling leaving Willie B. Again, I think he did exactly what you wanted him to do. I, I think he did exactly what you'd want. Exactly what you'd want. Took the keys to the car. Don't crash it. Return it the way you found it for Luke Doty so he can take his team to Greenville and get another big W and get to 2-0. and He did exactly that. But again, you're going to have to be dynamic offensively to win games in some capacity. And right now, it doesn't look like this is going to be a football team that is elite in the passing game. And that's okay. We were never expecting to be. We knew the wide receiver position was a concern. We knew the wide receiver position was most likely a deficiency. We did. And maybe I'll be proven wrong this weekend and the following weekends and throughout this season. Maybe we all will be. But there's nothing I saw from Saturday night that would change my mind and say, oh, we're going to be a surprise in the passing game. I don't see it. So, again, when you're asking me about the quarterback position and who should start and what should Shane Beamer and Satterfield do, I'm going to roll with whatever the decision-making is because, like I said, guys, there's, I don't have any reason yet not to trust Shane Beamer and Marcus Satterfield. I, you, know, you think they're going to play the guy that gives you the best chance to win. I'll say this, too. And I know the Gamecocks had eight penalties on Saturday night. you got to clean that up. It is week one. I thought it looked like a very well-coached football team. I talked about I wanted to see a football team that was laser-focused and locked in. I thought you saw that. I thought they handled the emotions very, very well. I thought this was a football team that stayed in the present moment. Again, didn't get too high, didn't get too low, and had a lot of fun out there as well. And again, when you win 46 and nothing, the fun, it truly is in the winning. On the defensive side, like I told you guys, you can't draw conclusions. Just because you pitched a shutout against EIU, it doesn't mean you're going to be a lead off defensively. I, you know, and again, I am not here on this Monday to be Debbie Downer or, or bring you guys down or, or whatever. You know what I mean? But it is the reality of who you were playing. It is the reality of you were playing a putrid FCS team that you should have beaten in the way that you did. I mean, this is a team that, again, it was like watching varsity versus B team. They didn't belong on the same field as you. They, they still don't. They don't belong on the same field as you. South Carolina could play that team 100 times, and they'd win all 100 games. There's no doubt in my mind. But you did see some promising things defensively. You're going to get a much stiffer test in that secondary and in the second level this weekend. And, of course, against Georgia. And I think even against Kentucky. We're going to start to learn a lot more about this football team. But overall, a great win, a great way to start the Shane Beamer era. Yes, there are things that need to be cleaned up. Yes, there are things that need to be worked on. But it is week one, man. It's week one for everybody. You look across the SEC, not everybody had glamorous week ones, right? Not everybody had great week ones. Ask that team in the upstate how their week one went. Wasn't all that fun. Wasn't all that great. And you absolutely loved to see it, by the way. But there are things you can build on. I think that it was a great game like we talked about. It was a great game for South Carolina to develop confidence, to start to feel like, okay, 
these are some of our guys that emerged as playmakers, guys we're going to be depending on. You know, I look offensively, I think you got to get the ball into Quandre White's hands more. He has really proven himself as he plays this game with an attitude, and you can go very, very far with his skill set and that attitude he plays this football game with. He, he, he runs as an offensive player like a dude that I feel like when he gets the ball, he is trying to take someone's head off. He runs mad he runs in that way so the quandre white's a guy you look at of course marshawn lloyd i think it's going to be a huge piece for you offensively the offensive line's got to get better there's no other way to put it the offensive line has got to get better the run blocking has to be better it has to be because that was my biggest concern and my biggest worry it's like dude if you're not shoving around eiu who are you going to push around the defensive lines are only going to get way, way better. I mean, again, we're going to talk more about ECU later this week, and I know um, we're going to jump into a little bit later what the line is and how absurd it is, but even ECU, I know their D-line's not great. I understand what they did against Appalachian State, but if you think ECU's line isn't worlds better than EIU's, hate to break the news, but they are. They absolutely are. Offensive line, you got to get better. You got to continue to try to find someone at the wide receiver position. You're not going to be able to win week after week after week with your leading receiver being a freaking running back. You just can't do it. Somebody's got to step up. Is Josh Van, does that give him confidence? And all of a sudden, he's ready to be your number one option. Does Jalen Brooks finally figure it out? I don't know how else to say it. The carry on joiner. I think a lot of fans were left scratching their heads about the carry on. What's going on with the carry on? Guys, if you want to be frank and you want to be honest about it, Dak's a quarterback playing wide receiver. Yes, he's got a skill set. Yes, he's very agile. Yes, he has quickness. But is that not the reality? That's kind of the reality you face right now at that receiver position. I tried to tell you guys all preseason long. You got a lot of guys in that room. You got to find some dudes, man. And if you can't be a dude against EIU on the outside, who on God's green earth are you going to be a dude against? That concerns me greatly. Like I said, defensively up front, that's your strength of your football team. That's certainly the strength of your defense. There's no question. I love what I saw from Brad Johnson at linebacker, his athleticism. I think he is poised for a great year and truly does bring that athleticism back to that position for South Carolina. And then your secondary, man. We're really not going to know about this secondary until the next few weeks. Ask me after Kentucky how I feel about the secondary. And I'll have a much, much better gauge and understanding of what this unit will be because I think there are talented players. I like Jalen Dickerson. I like Jalen Foster. Uh, Cam Smith, obviously, is the leader of this group. Darius Rush made some plays. But I don't think there's anyone mistaking and saying this 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 unit is a strength. You did what you should have done. In all phases, in all facets, even special teams, you did what you should have done against a team like this. And I will say, guys, it felt fantastic. I mean, to get a 46 and nothing win, like I said, you couldn't have asked for any better way to begin the Shane Bieber era, but there are things to work on. There is no question. There's a lot of things you still need to work on. I think a lot of previous feelings and thoughts and assumptions I had regarding this football team were only reconfirmed on Saturday night. But like I said, you didn't learn anything, but I don't think the purpose of a game like this was really to learn anything. Like that that wasn't the number one goal from going to and watching and seeing South kind of partake in a game like this. The goal of this game was to get a bunch of guys out on the field, which you did, have confidence, which you did, have something to feel really, really good about going into ECU, which you do, and get Shane Beamer his first ever win as South Carolina's head coach. So again, Gamecocks dominating 46 to nothing win over the EIU Panthers. Guys, let's hand out some game balls. We'll do this weekly TSUS game balls. We'll hand out a game ball for offense, for defense. Heck, we might hand out a couple of random ones as well. And we're going to start first. You got to give the first game ball. The way this man has been able to completely flip the energy and the vibe and the momentum and just the feeling amongst Gamecock Nation, seeing that all, you know, come to fruition and play out the way it did on the field Saturday night. Kudos to Gamecocks head coach Shane Beamer. He gets the first TSUS game ball, the 2021 football season, getting his first win as South Carolina's head coach. And I think you and I all believe the first of many wins in Columbia. Also, like I said, I thought this was a well-coached football team. I thought this team 
at no point Saturday night did I look at this and say, oh, we just don't look ready to play. We don't look focused. We don't look excited. We, you know, we're letting our, our emotions get the best of us. I never saw that. I never thought that. I thought this team was laser focused, locked in from the jump. So again, kudos to Shane Beamer, kudos to his staff. A lot of things could have gone wrong in his first ever game, being the first ever time you're a head coach. I thought he was a guy that looked very poised. And again, you know, when you have the opponent you played, it's it's not hard. You know, he was all smiles and giggles in the tunnel for 2001. And you understand why. Let's see how much we're smiling and we're giggling when you play in an SEC opponent. And, you know, we're playing someone that we're not a six touchdown favorite against. But again, TSUS game ball, it is only appropriate, in my opinion, the first game ball of the 2021 season goes to none other than your head coach getting his first win in Columbia, Shane Beamer offensively and defensively game balls for the offense. It's got to go to Zeb Nolan. I, I think Zeb Nolan, did he do anything flashy? No. Did he do anything crazy? No. Did he do anything out of the ordinary? No. Did he do enough to necessarily take the starting job? I don't particularly think so. Maybe some of you will disagree, but Zeb Nolan, what he did do, like I said, guys, leading in the week, he gave you that calming voice, that steady hand, that guy that we felt confident could go out there and at minimum run the offense efficiently. Don't do anything stupid. Don't put yourself behind the sticks. Don't, don't do anything unnecessary that even makes EIU for a second think they are in the football game or have a chance to beat you. I thought Zeb Nolan put the ball in really, really good spots for his guys, places where only they could go get it and make plays for you. He was very, very efficient, did not turn the football over. That is the big thing and made some really, really good throws. You know, a couple of those throws to Josh Mann, to your tight ends. Those were really, really nice plays. So give me the TSUS game ball for offense goes to none under the Gamecocks quarterback, Zeb Nolan. Defensively, I was so happy with this guy, man. Seeing him, his teammates douse him in water after he got the pick six. You, you could just tell what it meant to that young man, a guy that, again, when you come in as a five-star prospect and his recruitment was insane and, and all of these expectations and, you know, everybody's expecting you to be the guy and, you know, your coach gets fired and you go through it and I'm sure you start to question your, your decision. Like, man, did I make the best decision? What's going on? And it's just been a whirlwind, I feel like, since he stepped on campus. But Jordan Birch, man, to, to have that pick six, and did he have a huge night statistically? Not necessarily, but I think that's one of those moments. I think that's one of those plays that could really symbolize the beginning of a great 2021 season for him. I think the, the beginning of potentially breaking out and being a dude for your own defense. We know he's got the talent. We know he's got the potential. We know he's got the upside. It's been all about just putting him in the best possible position, having the coaching, and then putting it all together on the field. And I think maybe you start the, saw the start of that on Saturday night. So, again, my game ball for defense, the TSUS game ball for defense on Saturday night, give me Gamecocks defensive lineman, Jordan Birch. Guys, by popular demand, Slap Dick of the Weekend is back. We'll do this each and every single Monday. Slap Dick of the Weekend is back. Again, by popular request, many of you were asking me, Chris, is Slap Dick of the Weekend coming back? You're going to talk about Slap Dicks. It was a horrid, horrid day and a terrible night to be a slap dick on Saturday. Absolutely. And that goes, by the way, for every single Saturday. So if you, you're doing something silly, if you do something stupid, if you do something that deems you a slap dick, my goodness, you will be the slap dick of the weekend. But the thing that stood out to me as, I don't even know if we want to label this as like, this is a single person or an entity or just whoever was in charge, but my goodness, the amount of videos, the amount of DMs, and the amount of messages I got about the student tickets, ticketing situation and students not being able to get in, getting trampled, security, some of the stories I, I read and I heard, wild, absolutely wild. Kids fearing for their lives. Again, I don't know if that's on USC. I don't know if that's on security. I don't know if that's on game day operations. I don't know if that's on Ray Tanner. I have no idea. But after the BS that fans and students in particular had to put up with at Founders Park this year, as I stare at my Gamecock fan code of conduct paper that they handed us at Founders Park during the baseball season, the first football game, the first game of the Shane Beamer era, and we have something like this. This should not be a storyline. This should not be something we are talking about. So again, 
I don't know if it's USC. I don't know if it's game day operations. I don't know if it's Shane Beamer, but to whoever was in charge of that madhouse, you, sir, or madam, are the slap dick of the weekend. So again, would love to hear you guys' feedback on that. Again, continue to send in the stories. I'd love to hear what's going on. And if you know who was in charge, tag them and let them know that they're a slap dick. So again, <laughs> slap dick of the weekend, whoever was in charge, the sir or madame of the ticketing situation for Gamecock students, just grown folks just that don't know how to make decisions. I don't know how else to put it. Um, final thing, guys, this is a new segment for the 2021 football season, the cock of the walk award. So, of course, we all know what the cock of the walk is, right? This will be just think of this as our weekly game MVP, but the cock of the walk award, again, will be a week-to-week thing where I will pick one player who stood out who was the MVP of that football game. So the winner of the inaugural cock of the walk award and for the first game of the 2021 football season the cock of the walk award goes to running back Zaquandre White what a night it was for Quan White guys like I said picking up where he left off in regards to the spring game and the type of game he had there and the way he flashed but on Saturday night 12 carries for 128 yards, he had a touchdown on the ground. Of course, the long one, the 67-yarder, whatever it was that he broke late in the game, 10.7 yards per carry. He also was your leading receiver, guys, which is a little scary. But he was your leading receiver. Four catches for 39 yards and a touchdown. Overall, man, a fantastic night. Does this put him above Kevin Harris or Marshawn Lloyd? Or where does this put him in the Gamecocks running back room? I don't know. Again, guys, like I said, you want to be very careful when you're trying to draw conclusions from a game like Saturday night, but how good does it feel to know, dude, if he's your third string running back, we'll say, for example, what a luxury. What a luxury that is for South Carolina to have a guy who's running the ball like Zaquandre White. And again, also, that does make me think, I thought the running back did a great job of catching the ball out of the backfield, particularly particularly Zaquandre White and what he did for you. But again, doing it on the ground, doing it in the air, and the way he plays the game as well, guys, playing mad, playing physical, playing with toughness, playing with energy, playing with emotion. You absolutely love to see it. And I think he's definitely a guy you look at as someone who's going to be a big-time playmaker for you in this 2021 football season. So like I said, guys, the first ever Cock of the Walk Award goes to running back Zaquandre White. White. So guys, that's going to do it for my thoughts on EIU. We'll continue to break this thing down and dissect just what happened over the weekend. Of course, tomorrow's show, we will be chatting with Alex McGrath, getting all of his thoughts. But in closing, guys, like I said, a great win, a great way to begin the Shane Beamer era, truly a celebration of a new era for Carolina football. But I am not getting carried away. I, I am not. Nothing about what I saw on Saturday night changes my expectations for the 2021 football season. Nothing I saw changes my prediction or anything like that, guys. Like I said, if nothing else, I think Saturday night more so reconfirmed some of my thoughts in regards to, okay, we're good here, deficiency here, we don't really know here. So either way, all of the goals you had set for week one, you're 1-0. That's all that matters. And I think you accomplished those goals. I think you do leave Willie B and you come into this week you know, I don't know about warm and fuzzy, but you definitely have something to feel good about. And you feel like you have confidence going into what sets up as a pivotal game in Greenville, North Carolina this weekend as you take on the East Carolina Pirates looking to get to 2 and oh, Guys, let's dive into news and notes really quickly. Um, first things first, Shane Beamer mentioned this in the postgame, but you had five players suspended. For the game on Saturday night, I think one of them being R.J. Roderick. I did not see him listed anywhere. I think he was one of those that was suspended. Sounds like they will be, They all five of them will be back for the ECU game. You know, Shane Beaver saying they're very remorseful and they know they messed up. Um, yeah, so I think you should be good there. But again, just something I wanted to highlight in case you guys were wondering. Yes, there were five players suspended. Breaking team rules is all I really know. And uh, yeah, so... Apparently they're remorseful and you know they're they're, uh, they're going to they're going to get it figured out. So good to know, good to know. But kudos to Shane Beamer, by the way, for you know being firm and you know having a set, you know having set rules and standards and things. Hey, you can't do that. 
And if you do, we're going to punish you. I give kudos to Shane Beamer, honestly. I, I, that, that shows discipline within his program. That shows he's not going to put up with any BS. doesn't matter who you are. So, again, good job, Coach Beamer. I'd say that. Um, really quickly, guys, this is not something I planned on reading, but the student gate disaster, Gamecocks Online has actually tweeted about it. They've said, we are, we are, we're aware of the issues at the student entrance gates at last night's football game. We apologize to the students who were affected. Athletics is collaborating with student affairs, student government, and campus police to make sure this will never happen again. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what comes of that, but a very, just a very strange and interesting situation. Um, and again, something that should just never be a storyline, something that should never be a lead storyline for you. Um, another quick note, guys, and this one really took Gamecock social media by storm because, of course, we're all excited about what happened on Saturday night. And we'll talk about it and break it down, like I said, today, tomorrow, a little bit more on Wednesday. But then all the attention has shifted to South Carolina's game against East Carolina this week. And, of course, guys, I've been breaking this thing down and giving my thoughts on it. I've been talking about it for months now, just how big of a game it is. But, wow, the Vegas line. And, and you know what? Take it with a grain of salt if you want. Whatever. Just because Vegas lists you as a favorite or an underdog, it, it's not the end-all, be-all. But it is very interesting to know how nationally – how people are viewing this game and who they expect to win and by how much they expect them to win by. Because circus sports, our good friend at circus sports, that's generally who I lean on in regards to, you know, looking at lines. I, you know, they, they normally release their lines uh, the Sunday after a game for the upcoming weekend. So the lines drop, the lines come out. The Gamecocks opened as a two-point favorite, Right at Greenville. And, and most people that I talked to, most fans, they thought South Carolina was going to be an eight or a nine point favorite. And I tried to tell them like, dude, I'll be shocked if it's anything more than a touchdown. I, I, I just will. I'll be shocked with South Carolina's questions and uncertainties at quarterback and, and other issues. Of course, I, you know, I just would have been very surprised. Not only were they not an eight or nine point favorite, they were a two point favorite. And within a, within a matter of minutes, literally minutes, South Carolina went from being a two-point favorite to now a four-point underdog. A four-point underdog at East Carolina. Now, folks, I, I, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. I am very, very surprised. And I know many of you say, oh, we're getting disrespected, Chris. Like, what the hell? How could we be an underdog? I'm going to try to give the best explanation I possibly can because, again, guys, like I said, I'm very surprised, too. And this is not me making a pick, by the way. I think this is the thought process, though, with Vegas right now because there's no bias with them, right? Vegas, their bias is money. They, they, don't, they don't care about being a Gamecock fan. They don't care about being an East Carolina Pirate. They're trying to make money. They're trying to get even money on both sides. And I think this is the reason that ECU swung to being a favorite. It's like stocks, right? Buy low, sell high. That's what they tell you. And right now, this is the thought. This is the, the narrative around these two teams that are going to play this weekend. South Carolina's great. You know, they, they, they beat the hell out of somebody, 46 nothing. You blankly just look at that score. If you don't look at statistics, if you don't look behind the numbers, if you don't look at the opponent closely, you might think, oh, wow, you know, South Carolina, look how good they are. On the flip side, East Carolina gets – quote-unquote, throttled by Appalachian State, allows 6.4 yards per carry to the Mountaineers, and looked bad doing so. So we're all down and out on ECU. They're no good. They're terrible, whatever, this, that, whatever. And I think Vegas is using that to their advantage, and th what their belief is is that both of those opinions I just gave you are going to – it's going to swing a little bit more back to even – this upcoming weekend. Like South Carolina is not nearly as good as people think they are, or is that, you know, people feel like they showed, whatever, however you want to phrase it. And ECU is not nearly as bad as what they showed. And things will come a little bit more back to equilibrium this weekend when those two teams play. Again, guys, th that's my only way of justifying it. I, other than that, I have no idea. I, I, I'm very, very surprised to see the Gamecocks as a four-point underdog at East Carolina, that blows my mind. I mean, again, I understand the challenge of going to Dowdy Ficklin, but whew, at that, you know, especially after week one and how ECU looked losing by double digits and, like I said, getting pounded doing so, that really surprised me. So, again, it'll be very interesting to follow. That'll be very, very interesting to follow as 
we go throughout this football season, that'll be very, very, very interesting to follow. Um, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens in regards to that line and that spread, but who knows? Who knows? We'll see. All right, guys. Uh, appreciate you all tuning in. Let's jump to the phone lines real quick. Voicemails are back, guys. Be sure after every single game you call in, 843-790-3377. That is 843-790-3377. We'll jump to the phone lines here real quick. Hey, what's up, Chris? Been a while since I called, but had to call after the first game. So, uh, great performance in Beamer's first game. Uh Granted, the opponent, but anytime you shut out an opponent, it's pretty impressive considering Israel and the way never really threatened to score. Um, 46 points. He had two touchdowns called back. Uh, I thought Zeb Nolan played a great game. I thought he just played good touch on the ball, good command of the offense. Really wanted to see more of the offensive line just mauling and just just pounding the running game. You got a glimpse of it on on White's uh, long run or the just a massive hole up the middle. But wanted to see a little bit more of that. I'm hoping that'll go as we go forward. We'll see it. Wanted to see more out of the receivers. Obviously, Josh Van had a good game. Props to him. Glad to see that it's, it's finally happening for him. You know, have finally had a really good night. Wanted to see more from Joyner. Ortrey Smith had a good catch. Wanted to see more from Jalen Brooks. He did have a heck of a catch on the sideline. Tight ends were as good as advertised. Defensive front as good as advertised. Gordon Burt with the play of the night. My goodness. Jaheim Bell, even the play that didn't even count, the fullback handoff, he just breaks it up the middle. like, And, and it didn't even count. But, you know, all, all the way around, great game. We didn't learn a whole lot. I also agree with you that Luke Doty needs to be the starter going into East Carolina next week. A lot of things to clean up. Um, and we'll find out more about this team next week. But for now, let's enjoy this victory. Go Cowboys. Tim, appreciate you calling. Great stuff as always, man. Great insight. No, I, I agree with everything you said. Really reiterating a lot of the points I hit on. Uh, the wide receivers, the offensive line, you'd definitely like to see more. Definitely happy and excited for Josh Fan. But, again, I agree with you, Tim, all the points you made. Like I said, it's a great win overall. You're 1-0. The Shane Beamer era starts in the positive, but still a lot of question marks with this football team. There's still a lot of things that have to be figured out before you get into ECU and before you get into SEC play. We'll see how quickly the Gamecocks can figure that out. But really, the one thing, if there's one thing I want to see a major jump, that offensive line, Tim, has just got to play better. I, they just if, if, if the running game is what you're going to lean on, and I mean, you're going to have to lean on the running game, I, you know, are, are you are you going to be able to maybe a Josh Mann or some other guys are going to step up on the outside and be nice surprises, certainly. But, you know, you don't look at this team as, oh, they're going to evolve into, you know, a, a great passing team. I, I just don't see that happening. You're going to have to run the football. You're going to have to. So um, I want to see the offensive line from week one to week two. I want to see them make that jump. Other than that, though, yeah, I definitely agree with the points you hit on. I thought Zeb Nolan was really, really good. Your defense was incredible. Um so, overall, a positive opening game for Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks in this 2021 football season. Now it's all about can you make improvements? Can you pass the next test? And you've got to test certainly this upcoming weekend on the road against a dangerous ECU team in Greenville, North Carolina. Guys, we've got one more voicemail, and then we'll get to your listener questions. Chris, I'm sitting here watching LSU lose. They're not the only Tigers to lose tonight. Clemson lost too. Gamecocks are one to know. Gamecocks tonight. I'm encouraged. Uh, running game was good. Defense was good. Passing game got question marks. Got question marks in the passing game. But you know what? We had a backup quarterback and he got the job done. Uh, running game was good. Jordan Burt scored a touchdown. Shouts to him. We got the job done. I think tonight showed me that we can win five, six, seven games this year. We'll see what happens. I mean, uh, we got to be Kentucky. I mean, uh, I'm not looking at East Carolina. I think that's a, I think we're solid at a win there. But um, I'm looking forward to Kentucky. I think that's going to show us a lot. If we beat them, we might win six. We might win seven. We might win eight games this year. So uh, I'm feeling encouraged. We got the job done tonight. Shane got his first win. And uh, Beaver Ball is in Columbia, baby. Go Cox. My guy, John, appreciate it. And also want to say thank you to John. We had a fantastic time at Sea Wells on Saturday. Really, really good stuff. I cannot wait to party with you all out there each and every single Saturday 
of the Gamecocks football season. Again, guys, Seawells is the spot to be. I'm telling you right now, not to knock any other tailgate or anything else. Obviously, tailgating is great all over the Columbia area, but man, Seawells was a really, really, really good time. Again, spots 93 to 96. That's where we'll be, and you'll see the TSUS and Big Cock Club flags flying. But, John, yeah, no, I, again, I agree with everything you said. Um, you are definitely right in regards to that Kentucky game. And, and that, you know, as long as you take care of your business this weekend, which it's crazy, I, I didn't expect to say that if you can get the upset this weekend in Greenville, that, that feels so strange to say. But according to Vegas, I guess that's what it would be. Um, but, no, yeah, that, that Kentucky game to me really sets up as the game that's going to be sort of the measuring stick game for, okay, like, where are you? Like, how, how close are you or how far away are you from being where you want to be? You know, I think that's going to be one of those games that really determines, are you going to be a team that's fighting to finish sixth, you know, fifth or sixth in the SEC East? Or are you team a team that could realistically push and finish, you know, third or maybe fourth in the SEC East? So, again, that's definitely going to set up as long as you can take advantage and, and, and win this game at ECU. And you certainly don't want to look ahead of the pirates, but if you can take care of business there, you know, you've got a game this weekend, you feel like you should win. You got a game in Athens. You feel like you probably should lose that game against Kentucky. What do you do? That's going to be truly, I think your measuring stick game, as long as you can get past the pirates this weekend at Dowdy Ficklin Stadium. All right, let's guys, guys, let's get into your listener questions and we'll wrap this thing up. We'll get into our interview with Chris Doring. Krusty Andy says, psych to see Harris, Doty, Brown, and Jenkins in action. Felt like we withheld weapons. I, did we withhold weapons? I, I'm sure to some degree we did. I, I mean, I'm sure to some degree we did. I, I don't, I don't feel like guys we played like, I mean, there was nothing crazy in regards to play call, but I didn't think we played like some really vanilla conservative game. Um, I definitely think you have more probably than what you showed. I'm excited to see Luke Doty get out there and his dynamic, what he brings to this offense. But overall, a good job on the offensive side of things. And I thought the game plan was very, very solid. Um, Garner Cree, people said offense didn't do good, but they had like 150 yards called off because of flags. I thought the offense played a solid game. Was it dominant? I, I won't go as far as to say that, but it was a solid game. It was a solid game, no question. Um Let's see. Jay McClary, 28. Are you concerned at all about the O-line? I, I think they will come around. I, you, you've got the players up there. There's no question. I don't know what it was on Saturday night. I don't know why the run blocking wasn't quite there the way I wanted to see it. I think they'll come around, though. Now, if you can't run the ball or do any better against ECU, then I will start to worry because you felt like the offensive line was going to be your strong suit, a strength, you need them to be. You, you, you just got to be solid in the line of scrimmage. You have enough problems on the offense that you're trying to figure out, enough question marks you're trying to solve without having to also deal with the offensive line. Uh, Davis Ledford, Bama will be our first good test. That's how good we are. Attaboy, Davis. <laughs> um, Chambers, CO3 says, I was sitting right behind you. Attaboy, Chambers. Um, let's see. KS Johnson 901 says definitely have some cleaning up to do from all the penalties, but all aboard, all aboard. Indeed. Thomas Wade, we are one and zero, and Clemson is zero and one. Let's go. Thomas Wade. Those are facts. Those are facts. Thank you for putting that out. Uh, head trainer West lack of home run balls. A couple of times tonight where it seemed like an obvious option. No, I, dude. I just, I don't know that you have that guy right now, man, that you can take that deep shot. Um, I mean, you'd love to obviously see South kind of stretch the field a lot more. They're going to have to, but, who do you throw it to at this point, man? I mean, you don't just want to throw it up as a prayer. You know, you want to actually execute and the potential of that play actually being there. You want to be able to complete that play. And I just don't know who you have on the outside to do that, man. That, that's going to be something you got to find. You got to find quickly. You got to find somebody, like you said, that you can take that deep shot with. Um, let's see. Jarok C. Uh, no, Jarok did this beat, says Zebra Luke moving forward. I think Luke Doty, I, I think he's dynamic. I think he gives you the best option. I think he's the best chance to win, uh, to be honest with you. I think you're going to have to be dynamic at some point on offense. Luke Doty is the guy that makes this offense dynamic, in my opinion. Uh, Elvis DMD, awesome win. See plenty to hope for and things to fix, but definitely a huge leap forward. I agree. I agree. Great win all the way around. Um, now you got to take the next step, week one to week two, make that improvement. Um, let's see. Austin G, do you think it's possible that Zaquandre White continues to get the starting nod after what he did? Why not? Why not? He looked incredible, and he looked incredible in the spring game. I mean, this is a guy playing with a lot of confidence, and you see the explosiveness. I mean, here's the thing. Does it matter who starts? Because they're all going to play. They're all going to play. It really doesn't matter. But who knows? Maybe he can be your guy. Um, 
Creek 61. I know it was Eastern Illinois. How about them boys, Van and Birch? Yeah, great games for both of them. Uh, little dot omen underscore big cock energy right here. <laughs> yeah, shout out to all the big cock club members who were out and about Saturday in Columbia. It was awesome stuff. Uh, the Riley Carroll, what do you think about the Georgia Clemson game? So happy. So happy with that result. I'll leave it at that. Um, Toy Caldwell fans, positive energy and atmosphere was every amazing. Everything was right. I agree. South Carolina is fun again, he says. Uh, last question. G. Kane. Kevin Harris will be in the Heisman race all season. G. Kane. I hope you're right. Hope you're right. Guys, appreciate the questions. Appreciate the voicemails. Thank you all so much for interacting, being engaging, really, really fun stuff. And again, thank you all so much to those who made this weekend such a massive success from the live shows to the tailgate to being in the game itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for the continued love and support, guys. I cannot say enough. On that note, we have a fantastic conversation, a really special interview, guys. The guy who was literally on the call for SEC Network Plus, if you watch the game on TV, I'm sure you heard him, Chris Doring. He played his college football at Florida under Steve Spurrier, but currently with the SEC Network, covers SEC football, and really, really excited for you guys to hear his perspective on Shane Beamer, the game itself, his projections for this football team in 2021. Really, really, really good stuff, and appreciate Chris Doring for taking the time. So again, folks, thank you all so much for tuning in. Have a great rest of your Monday. Have a great holiday. We're rocking. We're rolling all week long. Thank you so much, guys. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this interview with Chris Doring of the SEC Network. All right, joining us on the Spurs Up show, guys, a very special interview and a unique conversation. I cannot wait. He played his college football at Florida for the Gators from 1991 to 1995, so we won't hold that against him, but he was also in the NFL from 96 to 2006, but most notably right now, he is an analyst for the SEC Network and was on the call Saturday night for SEC Network Plus for Shane Beamer's debut as the Gamecocks took down Eastern Illinois 46 to nothing at wiggins Bryce Stadium. Again, guys, someone we all know of or familiar with, if you watch SEC Network in any capacity, and does a fantastic job for those guys. Chris Doring joins the show. Chris, appreciate you taking the time in. It's a pleasure to have you on. And again, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on. And, and um, first and foremost, I mean, we can at least unite over the Coach Spurrier thing, right? I mean, I think <laughs> yeah, that's, that's... Uh, one thing we all have uh, in common. So yes, yes, really, Gators. Uh, yeah, really enjoyed yeah. my time with him and, and love uh, what he did at, at both Florida and at South Carolina. And certainly, man, every time I go to Columbia, the, the fans are so hospitable and, and love that area. Love being out there at williams Price last night with the return of all the fans. It was, uh, it was an amazing atmosphere, even though it wasn't packed. It was great to see the energy in the stadium again. Yeah, the Gators and Gamecocks fans definitely unite over Coach Spurrier and some of the great stories. You know, of course, doing what we do, I've had tons of former players and just hearing those guys and their stories around Coach Spurrier. We could spend an entire show just yeah. talking about Spurrier stories, I'm sure, and just hearing from some of the guys, some of the quarterbacks that played under him at USC and the receivers. And, I mean, he, he was – he was he's 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 a character. He's Steve Spurrier for a reason, for sure. I know you felt that being a receiver. But again, like you said, Chris, you were in the building uh, Saturday night as the Gamecocks opened the Shane Beamer era, taking down EIU in blowout fashion, forty six to nothing. I, I want to talk even before the game though, and this preseason, Chris, because of course, you know it was really interesting after two thousand twenty. We went into that season with all the madness in the world and this thought process of, oh, you know, no one's going to get fired because of the economic ramifications and the pandemic and this that whatever all these excuses. And I feel like we saw even more change in the SEC that we normally see. And I think a lot of schools felt, you know, after South kind of pulled the trigger, you know, you saw a lot of other schools follow suit. But Shane Beamer gets the job. I've been most impressed with the way he's been able to change the entire energy. You talked about the energy in that stadium, even though it wasn't packed necessarily. The energy around Gamecocks football, and I know you guys on the SEC, SEC Network have talked about these new coaching hires, who's going to have the most success, the challenge that lies for each yeah. coach. Just your overall thoughts on, first off, just Shane Beamer getting the job and just how you think his first preseason in Columbia has gone from what you could tell being in Columbia, being around him and being around the program, your overall thoughts yeah. on him leading into Saturday night, if you will. Well, first and foremost, you know, when I first heard the name Shane Beamer being tossed around as a guy that might be the next head coach there at South Carolina, you know, I didn't know a ton about him, to be honest. I didn't necessarily understand the tie that existed between him and, and the university. But as I heard more from people that are on the inside there, more uh, people that knew him when he was in South Carolina on the coaching staff as an assistant, it made more and more sense. And then when he was hired, 
to see the the emotion that he had for coming back to Columbia, for coming back to that program, it, it made even more sense. And now that you're right, there's a new renewed enthusiasm uh, in the fan base and, and just energy in that building, man. And walking around and talking with with not only Coach Beamer but the assistants, um, with with some of the staff that's there, like it, it just seems like it's a new era, which obviously it is. And at the end of the Coach Muschamp era, the end of last season, things were pretty low. But I, I just, you know, I know it's going to be a long road but at the same time I also know that that uh, I think they got the right man for the job I think he's got a commitment to that program that few other head coaches probably would have had so I think South Carolina tab the, the right guy for sure now again you spent a couple of days with Shane Beamer the staff like you mentioned of course being on the call Saturday night just your overall feelings and the vibe of what you got from Shane Beamer again I, I thought looking at the game I, I thought Sal kind of came out ready to play I thought overall coaching I thought he did a very, very good job. And again, you were against the opponent. You were against EIU, which we can talk about more in a second. But I thought overall, I thought Shane Beamer handled himself very well. His football team handled themselves. Everybody looked poised, you know, composed. Of course, in week one, the emotions are running high. We're back to packed stadiums and packed tailgates. And like you mentioned, the emotions flying high with, with his debut. But what was the sense, I guess, like you just talked about it a little bit, but the sense in the building this past week and then leading into Saturday, did, did you get a sense from Shane Beamer of sort of that calm demeanor? Obviously, he's a very positive, upbeat, optimistic guy. But I, I guess what was the overall vibe from Coach Beamer going into that yeah. game Saturday night that you picked well, up? I loved being in in uh, the same room with him. You know, at, at last year, there were so many Zoom calls that took place. And so it was nice, first and foremost, to be back on site, uh, to have an opportunity to uh, press the flesh with, with him and his, uh, his, his uh, coordinators. I love the hires as a whole, that, that entire coaching staff. Uh, one of the things he mentioned to me when I asked him about, you know, putting together that staff, he said, look, I've, I've had a list for a long time of the top three coaches I wanted every position. And he said, I got eight of the 10 that I, I had on that list, which was pretty impressive in and of itself. I had a chance to talk to one of my former teammates, Mike Peterson, who's been on the staff both with, with Coach Muschamp and now with, with uh, Coach Beamer and, and, you know, his excitement about what he's seeing and, and witnessing. I'm really impressed with with the two coordinators, Marcus Satterfield, who, um, you know, actually, I have, I, I guess he, he may have played up to me because he showed me a picture of him playing wide receiver at number 28. He goes, guess who my my hero was back in the day? And, and uh, the guy that I looked up to, he, he said, I'm actually a little intimidated to sit down and talk to my idol. So that was really a cool moment for me. And then with uh, Clayton White, who uh, I didn't know a ton about, was really impressed with him. So all in all, I mean, I, I, I could not think more highly of the staff that he's been able to assemble the passion that they all have for being where they are now and just to a man ever I ask each of them what was the goal going in and play playing against Eastern Illinois you know an overmatched opponent in week one uh, it was just you know banging off the rust getting out there and all of them say hey we want to look like a well-coached team we want to be able to not have a bunch of penalties we want to get 11 guys on the field lined up in the right spots and we want to be able to execute which I thought they did for the most part uh, there's some sloppiness in the second half. You know, I, I think that's the thing I look at is how you come out of the second half, especially when you have a big lead. Uh, so they need to clean that up. A couple big play opportunities, some touchdowns that were negated by penalties. But all in all, you know, I thought that from the start to the finish, they all showed like they were dialed in and, and showed the energy that I think you would want your players to have, particularly playing in a game like this where you expect to walk over the opponent. Now, again, we're talking Gamecocks 46 to nothing win over EIU, talking to Chris Doring, who was on the call for that football game Saturday night. Let's talk offensively first, Chris. Zeb Noland. I mean, that's a name that nobody even knew who he was three weeks ago. And one of those, one of those feel-good stories in college football that you just really don't get at any other level of football. But Zeb Noland once a GA starting quarterback Saturday night. I know it was sort of made a made as a joke by some, if you will, nationally, but I thought watching Zeb Nolan go throughout that game, again, I think he went 13 for 21 for like 150 or something and four touchdown passes, which I don't think anybody saw coming. But I think you understood with Luke Doty's injury why they handed the keys to the car with him, with his efficiency and the way he took care of the football. To me, he played like a veteran, a guy who the moment wasn't too big. He seemed poised. He led his huddle. He led his football team. And he didn't put the ball in harm's way. First, just talk about the story overall. I mean, to you, have you ever heard of anything like that where a GA literally comes off the staff and he's the starting quarterback two weeks later? And then just overall, your thoughts on the way he played Saturday night. Yeah, it's an amazing dynamic, you know, in, in talking with uh, Coach Satterfield, 
he mentioned the fact that they had, you know, a, a high school recruit coming in in the off season, didn't have a quarterback to throw to him. So got uh, Zeb Nolan to throw and, and uh, they made the joke about the fact that he had some eligibility back. If not for that day, I don't know that any of the co coaches on the staff would have even known mm -hmm. that Zeb Nolan had a, a, another year of eligibility remaining. So the fact that that worked out the way that it did and, and, and to your point, the reason that he was out there was because of exactly what you said, played like a veteran. He was a veteran. He's played a lot of games and, and played more recently before last night than anybody else on that staff, having played in the spring at North Dakota State. Um, a, a guy that, that obviously as a GA knows the offense very well, knows where to go with the football, was efficient, as you said, took a lot of easy throws. But those numbers could have been a lot better. I, I thought the throw he made on the opening play uh, mm -hmm. to Jalen Brooks, I believe it was, yeah. was a great throw. Could have been caught uh, just – missed off of, of the, the fingertips of the receiver there but there were a lot of really good decisions that were made a lot of really good throws and how about this tight end core you know you look yeah. at Nick Muse and Jaheim Bell both of those guys are, are big time weapons and the versatility of Jaheim Bell you saw the run that got called back was uh, pretty impressive but using those guys particularly in the red zone the way that Zeb Nolan did really was a, uh, a, a tip of the cap to how well he knows this offense and the way that he just Let's things develop. I thought that he just did a nice job of taking what the defense gave him. And when there wasn't anything there, he even showed the propensity to be able to run the football as well for a first down. Chris, when you talked to Marcus Satterfield going into this game, did he give any sort of indication of what their plan is going to be moving forward for the quarterback position? Of course, Zeb Nolan. I mean, really, this doesn't come about most likely if Luke Doty doesn't get injured in a scrimmage in the preseason. Shane Beamer said he's going to be 100% back this week. He'll be back for East Carolina. So, of course, you know, the conversation from the fan base and those around Gamecocks football turns to, okay, who's QB1? D did you get any sense of a feeling of what they want to do at that position? And I'll just ask you, I, I know the sample size for Doty is small, but certainly he brings a dynamic to your offense that no one else does. I mean, we're talking about a guy that runs a 4 4 40, that quickness, agility, that speed, that athleticism we haven't seen under center really since Connor Shaw manned the position when the Gamecocks had their greatest run in school history. But overall, that position, I guess, what are you expecting? And did you, did you pick up anything from Satterfield or Beamer about their plans for moving forward under center, if you will? Yeah, they were kind of close to the vest on it. I asked them about the timeline for um, Doty's return. Obviously, you know, they made the announcement, I guess, uh, today about uh, expecting him back um, on uh, uh, for this week's game against East Carolina. But, you know, it, it, it's a luxury to have a guy like Zeb Nolan that you know you can trust. Um, it is a small sample size with some mixed reviews last year on what we have with Luke Doty. Uh, you're right. I think the athleticism and the explosiveness that he brings at the quarterback position is something that you can certainly use, particularly when you're down in talent a little bit. I, I, I do like, though, now, again, I mentioned the tight end position. The running backs are extremely deep, as we saw last night with both White and McDowell. Um, I, I think that the receivers, they're actually more uh, pleased with the receivers than I think the fans are because they uh, – Coach Satterfield said to me, hey, let's don't judge these guys until they've had a chance. Last year it was all Shai Smith and nobody really else, but I think they, they feel really good about the top four or five wide receivers that they have. So, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, you have in one guy, Zeb Nolan, a game manager, a self-admitted game manager that's just there to distribute the football. And then Luke Doty, a guy that can bring a little bit more explosiveness to the offense, but I think also brings a little more risk in some of the plays that he tries to make. So it'll be interesting to see what they decide to do particularly with Georgia on the horizon the following week after East Carolina and watching that Georgia defense. I don't know if you have a chance to watch that game or not, but it's amazing how fast those guys are, how aggressive they are, and how well coached they are on that side of the ball. Now, flipping to the defensive side of the ball, Chris, because, oh, by the way, the Gamecocks did pitch a shutout in their season opener. No matter who you're playing, that is something you can hang your hat on. Obviously, Clayton White's unit, a phenomenal job. And it really, we knew going in this game, and I'll tell you this, Chris, I don't feel like we necessarily learned anything new, and you're not really going to in a game like this, but I was reconfirmed some previous thoughts, and certainly one of the previous thoughts was that we all felt like the South Carolina defensive line was going to be arguably the strength of your football team, and I think you really saw that on Saturday night with the athleticism and guys like J.J. Nigbare and Jordan Strawn and Brad Johnson and you know Jordan Birch with the big pick six, and I mean, him catching the ball was one thing. Taking off for the touchdown, I mean, really, he showed that freakish ability and why he was a five-star prospect. Your takeaways overall, getting to see that group in person and just how good you think that Gamecocks defensive line is and can be this year. 
Yeah, well, we, we knew that was going to be the strength of the team heading in. And then talking with, you know, both Coach Beamer and Coach White about it, uh, they further, you know, continue to expound on, on just how good that group is and how, how much they mean to the team, not only in production, but leadership in that locker room as well. Some veteran guys there that have, have played a lot of snaps in this conference. So um, it was impressive to see last night. Some of that being that the offensive line for uh, EIU was overwhelmed a little mm. bit. But again, you can't control who you're playing against and you got to go out there and execute. I was really, really happy for Jordan Birch. As, as I talked about on the on the broadcast last night, this is a guy that, that came in as one of the most heralded recruits that South Carolina has ever signed before. And most of the time, you, you expect a lot from those guys. The bar is set really high. I'm sure he was disappointed that he didn't get a chance to contribute more last year. But I've, I've seen from him and heard from him all the right things. A guy that's being patient that understands that, you know, he's still got a lot to learn and still has, uh, can learn from some veteran guys in front of him, but to get a chance to get in there. And as you mentioned, a, a big guy like that catching the football the way that he did with his hands and then being able to run away from everybody else was certainly impressive. So very happy for him all night long. The theme was defensive line meeting at the quarterback, just playing fast, playing aggressive and, and finishing plays. So I, I love what they can do to maybe offset some of the youth and inexperience in the secondary. Not, not only youth, but I mean, how many of those guys do we have in the secondary that are, are transfers from other places? Uh, I do think it's going to be a work in progress. But when you have a defensive front like that, that can uh, negate uh, some of the, the, uh, the inexperience or, or, or lack of chemistry in the secondary, it's, a, it's quite the, uh, uh, the asset for sure. Certainly a great starting point to build your defense around when you've got those big uglies up front. And that, that was going to lead me to my next question. How, how did Clayton White sound when talking about the secondary? Because, again, a lot like the wide receiver position offensively, I mean, it's no secret that's the biggest question mark of the defense and one of the biggest on this football team in South Carolina. You know, in games, that's going to be the key for them. I think we'd both agree that in games where they struggle to generate that consistent pass rush, you're going to be very vulnerable at that spot. You're going to have to have guys, like you mentioned, step up. You know, obviously Cam Smith leading those, but all your transfers and just guys who are who are unproven, you know, you're going to have to step up to the plate and play, play great football when you get in the grind of that SEC schedule. But how did Clayton White sound about it? Did he give you any indication of what the defensive game plan is? Because, Chris, one of my biggest questions has been, is South kind of going to be more aggressive and maybe send an extra body or two and put their DBs on an island but risk trying to get to the quarterback? Or are they going to – sit back, help their secondary, and just trust they can get get there with three or four. What, what did you pick up from Clayton White and his overall feelings on that? Yeah, I, I tried to, to discern some of that, but it was difficult. You know, I, I asked him about was the game plan against Eastern, was it based upon something you see from them on tape? Obviously, there was a game in the books against Indiana State in week zero for, for EIU. Uh, or was it about just running your stuff? He said, hey, I'm treating this game like the Super Bowl. I'll focus on them. Um, so I, I think they were really locked in on trying to do what they could to negate whatever they had seen on tape from, from uh, them against Indiana State. Uh, but at the end of the day, he was – both he and Coach Beamer talked about how down they were with numbers. I think they lost five guys from last year's roster in the secondary. Uh, so having to replace those guys was, was difficult. Uh, some guys have played multiple positions back there in the secondary, but really, you know, he, he spoke very fondly of, of, uh, of Jalen Foster, uh, Jalen Dickerson as well, the type of work they've done. I, we saw Davis Balding last night on a couple of different plays come up, make a tackle short of the, the line to gain on, on a pass, and then uh, looking aggressive a lot around the line of scrimmage, tackling uh, on the, a, a run, tackling the ball carrier in a run. So, I, you know, I, I do think it's going to be a little bit of an Achilles heel back there, but at the same time, uh, there are some some things that you saw on tape now that, that lead you to believe there's some some promise there too. So, uh, Coach Beamer did mention he said if there's two spots I'm worried about, it's it's probably at the linebacker spot in terms of depth, and in the uh, secondary there with uh, all the departures from last year and trying to get all those guys um, acclimated playing together in the secondary. Now, Chris, you see the hat. We got to talk about Beamer ball special teams making an impact early in the Shane Beamer era. I feel like it's only right, right? With with Shane Beamer and his father's legacy and what they were known for, the Gamecocks blocking two punts last night. And I mean, you know, if you look at the statistics in football, I mean, I know last night you would have won either way, but you look at the statistics and how big a deal it is to make those game changing plays and special teams and block kicks and block punts in the return game. Your chances of winning go up astronomically when you make those type of plays, but Seeing that, you know, the two-point conversion as well was something that was very underrated. And I've said this all preseason, Chris, that, you know, it's very hard to make predictions in regards to how many 
kicks are you going to return or kicks are you going to block or punch or whatever. But I do feel confident with Shane Beamer and Pete Limbo. You could argue this is the most well-coached special teams unit in the entire country. Just just show some love to the special teams and what you saw from that, those guys last night. Well, it's a great point, and you can't necessarily count on always blocking a punt or returning a, a, a punt for a kickoff for a touchdown. But what you can do is you can send your message to the team that you're going to be aggressive in special teams. And I thought that that's what they did last night. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, it comes from uh, a lineage that's committed to, to playing great special teams. And what a treat it was for me last night to have Coach Beamer, Frank Beamer, in the booth with us and, and his son's debut. Really special uh, for anybody that, that knows anything about college football, one of the all-time greats. So um, that was really cool. But uh, probably should have been three block kicks, if we're being honest. They had a chance at the first one. I don't remember who the player was, but it looked like he could have extended his hands and probably blocked it pretty easily. Uh, but again, nice to see them line up with a swinging gate. You know, they, they're a, if they don't line up right, we're, we're going to be well coached enough to throw the ball out there and, and take advantage of a numbers advantage, which they did. Uh, and then the block punt uh, being aggressive a couple different times and, and being able to have some success. They gave their offense some short field situation. I, I don't think this offense is going to be good enough early in the season to put together 12 play 80 yard drive. So it's going to be important that you have some field position opportunities, whether it's a, a, a block punt, a kick return, or even a uh, sudden change turnover with a, a, a defensive, um, you know, strip sack or, or a, a pick that sets you up in good field position. So I do like the message that that sends not only to the fans and the media, but specifically the team that we're going to be an aggressive team all year long. Now, Chris, as you move off of this game, Gamecocks are 1-0, that 1-0 feeling, if you will, but things are about to get very, very, very real as you head on the road to take on a dangerous East Carolina team in Greenville, North Carolina. Then the grind of the SEC season kicks in when you take on, oh, by the way, the Georgia Bulldogs, who we just saw what they did over the weekend. You've got a pivotal home game with Kentucky, and as you navigate through this season, you mentioned earlier, and I'm someone that keeps it very real with the Gamecocks fan base in regards to the challenge <clears throat> that Shane Beamer has in front of him in this roster and the real holes and deficiencies that are there. And, you know, he's going to have to build this program. It's going to take recruiting classes to get South kind of back to or close to back to what they were or where Gamecock fans want this program to be. But when you look at, again, you're 1-0 right now. Uh, I think the goal, realistically, if you can get to 6-6, six and six, if you can find a way to get to a bowl game, that's a massive success, I believe, in Shane Beamer's first season. That gives you something to build off of, and especially it's something you can sell in recruiting, right? When, when you looked, you saw this team Saturday night, but overall for this 2021 season, even before the season, what were your expectations for Gamecocks football, and you think realistic expectations, what Shane Beamer and company can achieve in their first season in Columbia? Yeah, I've been actually labeling this as year zero for Shane Beamer and the staff. I think with all of the departures that they had from last year's team, the numbers being down, as we talked about on the broadcast last night, only 79 scholarship uh, football players right now. I think one of those was a, a walk-on that he gave a scholarship to uh, recently as well. So the numbers in and of themselves are not where you want them to be. Uh, but it's a great, a great starting point. I mean, I don't think most coaches – have the luxury of coming in and taking over a rebuild program with the type of talent that they have on the lines of scrimmage in, in South Carolina. So uh, that is a, a benefit. But at the end of the day, you're right. You're going to have to to build that roster up. And I, I hope the fans understand that it is a, a, a building process and not an overnight situation. I, I love talking with, with Coach Beamer about his focus in terms of recruiting, making sure you're locking down the state of South Carolina. It's challenging with Clemson being in the state and the success they've had of recent uh, uh, years. I think also being able to take advantage of all the talent in nearby bordering states in Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina, but also going up into the Northeast. I think it's a little different plan than what some of the other sort of, uh, South Carolina coaches have had recently. He talked about being good in both or in all three of that, that uh, DMV, uh, DC, Maryland, and, and Virginia. Uh, so I, I do think they've got a good plan in place. And I think a lot of those, it was interesting to hear him say, how many people from up in the Northeast were familiar with South Carolina coming down vacationing in Myrtle Beach and some of the surrounding uh, areas uh, to the University of South Carolina? So I, I think they've got a good plan in place, but I do think it's going to take some time. I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, getting to me, getting the six wins would be a masterful job considering the schedule, having to play in the SEC, having to play Clemson. So, you know, I don't know if that's possible or not, but I, I just I want to see improvement every week. I want to see some something that gives me hope a fun brand of football, a fun brand of offense and defense that you can look to, to recruits and say, hey, come be a part of what we're doing here. You're going to have a chance 
to play early and you're going to have a chance to play in, in systems that are really fun, that are going to allow you to, to show what you can do and give yourself an opportunity to go to the next level. Chris, you mentioned hope. Hope's not a strategy, but without hope, you have nothing. And I think Gamecock fans would tell you it feels great to have hope in the football program yet again. Talking about SEC as a whole before we get you out of here, obviously a very, very fun first weekend in college football. And I mean, we saw some pretty wacky upsets, some wild upsets all across college football. But of course, two things that seem to remain constant is Alabama and Georgia are the cream of the crop in the SEC. Is it as simple in the SEC this year as Bama, Georgia, SEC title and most likely Bama winning it again. I mean, what, what's your overall take and your thoughts after week one of the SEC, how it shakes out? Well, Georgia has a ridiculously good defense. You know, they lost their top seven uh, defenders from the secondary last year, and it didn't look like an issue to them at all, <laughs> primarily because of how good their front seven is. I mean, they, they looked fast. They looked physical, aggressive. I love their one-on-one -on -one tackling in space, and, and what a great job they did. They look like they know exactly what they're supposed to do, and they execute really, really well. So that's that's got to be scary for offensive coordinators here in the SEC East for sure. Uh, Bama surprised me. I thought that offensively um, they were going to be a little more conservative and have to, to try to work through some chemistry issues, but they looked like they didn't miss a beat despite having replaced all the production they had from last year. Uh, that, that defense as well, we don't talk about enough how good they are on that side of the ball, but what a luxury to have the experience that they have there. I do think you know there's some improvement in the SEC West, the LSU – did not look what I think a lot of people were thinking they were going to be, but I think A&M will be a, a, a good test for them. I'm anxious to watch uh, Ole Miss on Monday night. I think Ole Miss is one of the teams that I look forward to having a big step forward this year. Uh, it, it stinks that, that Lane Kiffin's not going to be there for, for the opening game, but I, I think they're in good hands with Jeff Levy, who's probably the next up-and-coming coach uh, that'll, that'll leave from the SEC and have a chance to have a big-time uh, Power 5 job. Um, but all in all, you know, it, it, it does look like it's going to be Alabama and Georgia. I picked Georgia to be the, the preseason favorite to win the East, to win the conference and to win the national championship. Um, I, I don't know that they necessarily saw what they were expecting to see from Clemson's defense, and it took them some time to adjust. But uh, they, they're, they've got a bunch of athletes, and, and as they continue to get more healthy, I, I'm hearing Darnell Washington, unfortunately for you guys, will probably be back for the South Carolina game. But uh, they, they do have – to, to work on a few things offensively to, to complement what we saw on the defensive side. Great minds think alike. Chris Doring, he and I both have the Georgia Bulldogs. I'm a believer too, man. I think they win the SEC, win the national championship. I think Kirby's finally got the quarterback. And like you said, you saw that defense. You yeah. saw that defense Saturday night and just athletes on athletes on athletes. Chris Doring of the SEC Network, this has been a pleasure. Last thing, thing Chris, before I get you out of here, of course, like I said, I've had many former Gamecocks that have shared many great Spurrier stories. So I'll put you on the spot. Any Spurrier stories you want to share that – Anything that stands out for you personally with Coach Spurrier? Obviously, Gamecock fans, we've got a lot of love for your former head coach. So Yeah, no, I, I love Coach Spurrier. Oh, so much to him. And, and just, um, you know, over the years, so many, everybody that's ever been around him has the, the Spurrier voice and, and does the <laughs> imitation, you know. So we all still to this day uh, get together and, and, and tell some of those stories. But I just – I love the, the uh, competitiveness, the intensity that, that he had. Um, you know, we, I always talk about, uh, there were words that you weren't allowed to say. The F word was not something he liked on uh, you know, Sunday through Friday. But on, on Saturday, if you messed up, you were likely to maybe maybe hear one of those from time to time slip out from him. But uh, nothing bad that I can say about him You know, outside of my parents. I don't know that there's uh, a, a, an adult that has had a bigger impact on my life and given me an opportunity not only to walk on and have the chance to, to play the way that I did, most coaches don't give walk-ons an opportunity over their scholarship guys, but he loved guys that, that played the way that they were coached and did the things they were asked to do. Uh, so I had, you know, even unimagined success uh, that I, I couldn't even have dreamt of at Florida. And then he revitalized my NFL career after tearing my Achilles in, in Denver in 2000. I was out of the league in 2001. I was probably one of the only guys that was happy about Coach Furrier making the announcement he was going to go to the NFL because I knew it would give, my, give me an opportunity. And um, you know, I had some of my best seasons um, after that there in Washington and a couple in Pittsburgh because of him just uh, believing in me and giving me that chance. So, so happy you know, to think about what he did. He's on the Mount Rush Rushmore of, of coaches, in my opinion. What you see now from all of these spread offenses goes back to what we were doing at Florida long before everybody else, four and five wide receivers throwing the football around, uh, putting pressure on defenses, not only defenses, but the opposing offenses to try to have to score with us. So I, I am, I know we all feel the same about him at, at Florida and South Carolina and, uh, 
really love that he's become an ambassador for the SEC as, uh, as a whole now. Chris Doring of the SEC Network does a fantastic job for those guys and obviously a fantastic job on the call Saturday night as the Gamecocks open their 2021 season in style with a 46 nothing win. Chris, keep up the great work. Thank you so much for doing this. And like I said, appreciate everything you're doing with SEC Network. And uh, let's chat again soon for sure. Best of luck that the rest of the good. season, by the way. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I uh, appreciate what, what you guys do and, and promoting – uh, you know, the SEC brand in general, man, it's the passion of the fans that makes this conference so special, man. So I'm all about uh, what you guys are doing. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thanks. He's Chris Doring. I'm Chris Filty. Appreciate you guys tuning in. And we'll catch you next time on the episode of the Spurs Up Show.